is the 129th episode of Cloud Focus Weekly for the second week of March 2013. This episode is titled The State of Support. Cloud Focus Weekly is sponsored by Arcus, your supporting cloud computing experts. I'm your host, Jason Atwood, and supporting me for the 129th time is head of support. <laughs> support, support, support. Justin Elsing. Justin, how are you doing today? The athletic supporter. Here right. I am. Very nice. Uh, so we have this is a special podcast, aren't they all? Special? A very special, a very special episode about. It's like an afternoon. It's like movie. after school pro, yeah. after school. So we've been going around this issue for a while now, um, and we've been talking about support, and we've been talking about the the good and the bad, the ugly of support. We've been making examples out of people. Um, and I thought maybe it'd just be a time to kind of come make it into a real podcast and really just do nothing other than talk about support. Um, uh, so we do have we have an agenda, but it is a, it is pretty basic in that we're going to um, we're, we'll talk about we'll quickly talk about the blog post. It is my blog post of the week. That's though. the only reason why you included it because it has nothing to do with this. Yeah, well, yeah, it really, really has nothing to do. Well, but we always talk about the blog yeah, post of the week. We do. Okay, it's part of the agenda. Is part of the agenda, and then we'll talk about support. And really, what I want to break this down. Well, we'll get I into. I want to it ask now. you the ground rules. All right, but let's let's talk right, about let's the blog do post. The blog, no. okay, and then we'll get to the ground. I want to ask you the ground rules of what we're doing and what we're not going to. Okay, do. should probably do that on air while we're recording well, that's the podcast. What I mean. On air, I want to know off okay. the cuff the rules. Okay, so your blog post. I'll intro it. Sure. Taming the email monster revisited. That's correct. So you wrote a blog post. A year or two ago? Almost a year and a half ago, yeah. About taming the email monster with three easy tips. So you came back a year and a half later. Email's still here. <laughs> the monster is still around. Hasn't gone away. Uh, and we are now revisiting some of these tips. Uh, actually, you've given three more tips. Three more tips. Three additional tips as to how three. to manage your email inbox in a more efficient manner. Yep, and it's at blog.arcusinc.com. Not going to talk about it. Only want to talk about it is that I have someone, a friend of, on Facebook, yeah, said that they posted. I just went through about over two thousand emails and was deleting them out of my inbox, and I was inspired by your post. Ooh, so it's like a little, little real life, yeah, a little real life inspiration. I will say, I don't. I I was taught by you how to <laughs> tame the email monster That's... back when. We worked together at the large institution that shall remain nameless, and I use a lot of the tips that you've given, and some of the technologies have grown since those days to make managing email even easier. And you know, we used to use obviously Outlook, and now we use Mail.app on the on the Mac, which I think is a better email client than Outlook. Oh yeah. Um, and and I would say if you haven't read these. Now, six tips on how to tame the email monster. I would recommend reading them because, you know, it, it's while email is not your job, it is a part of your job. And if you're good at email, you can be better at your job for sure. Um, you know, a lot of people consider email their job, and that's because they're bad at email. Right. So. I, I find the people who are most, the, the worst at email, are the ones who complain about the most who make it into something like I don't talk about like I used to say back in the in the in the day I used to have the oh so many email uh can't you know it's like it's like it used to be it used to feel inundating I don't anymore because I basically I mean there's a there's a there's a there's an amount that I could get that I would not be able to deal with like you know 10,000 a day I probably would you know I would not be able to handle but I can handle Hundreds and do get hundreds a day doesn't bother me because I have a system that can basically just pound through it. And so, you know, I gave some tips before. I put in some new tips because we actually did an internal workshop about um, about email management. So I kind of took some of those tips and I built into a deck. It's proprietary, um, proprietary email deck. Um, but yeah, you should go go read it. And are Google presentations called decks? I don't Not know. really decks. You don't I don't even have, know where a deck comes from. Well, it's not I like the deck of a boat. When, I think it's when you print them. 
Exactly. Right? It's like a when deck. Would you consider that a deck? But I thought, like I think a it's, deck of cards. Oh, like a deck of cards. Okay. Yeah. That's true. So, well, you can print it. So, yes. Yeah, but so, I you mean, can print it with PowerPoint a deck until you print it? I don't know. Is it? If a, if a Questions power, for another day. If a PowerPoint <laughs> falls in the, in the woods. Um, I've been, side note, I've been enjoying Google's um, application suite more and more. Like when you talk about docs a lot. But I've I've now used fully used uh, the presentation whatever their slides whatever it's called presentation presentations whatever I've done uh, more than a few times and and their and their sheets uh, which I've actually using I think I tweeted this the other day I'm using to track my um, uh, track my tenth year anniversary and guests and people and all that I've been using that and collaborating with my wife and trying to teach her how to actually use sheets. Um, but finding it very, you know, like, oh, this is nice. Yeah. And so the tools are, you know. The little what, lady and I used Sheets uh, when we did the whole move into the new apartment. Right. So we used Do and a Sheet. Nice. There you go. It's yeah. a simple Quick organization. aside. Quick aside. All right. Let's get into the state of support. Support. So, again, you're going to ask me some questions, but I'm going to lay out some stuff, and then you can come back and ask well, maybe questions. Maybe you'll just lay it out, and right. I won't have any questions. So here's what I want to do. As I said before in last week's podcast, um, I said we are we have a unique view on this, uh, on support, um, for a couple reasons. One, I, I – I think I said this. One is we we do use support a lot. Okay, so everybody uses support. Everybody calls you know support and does that. Um, but two is that uh, we have built out systems for support, like literally been part of support and actually supported people. So I, we've been been the support agents ourselves in past lives. Like I, actually, I've done tech support as well as we currently build out systems for other people to do support. Plus, we here at at Arcus actually support apps. So it's like we're taking this from like at least three different levels, from people who do support, build support, and want support. Um, so do, want, build. Um, so, and I, you know, I guess one of the things that you're probably going to ask is, the ground are, rules. are we calling out actual companies? Well, here's, here's what I want to, because we have in our, in our agenda, we have the good, the bad, the ugly, and best practices. And I'd be happy to give out, you know, company names for the good. Okay. But when we get to the bad and the ugly, I mean, what are the ground rules here? Are we, are we calling the, out company names? Because I'd prefer to maybe not do that. Really? I, I, I feel like we should. I feel like – and it's not it's, – it's, it's called tough love. It's called listen, and we're not going to call it. We're not going to give out a bad thing and say this is this is a bad company because this this support incident. But we're going to use we'll it as examples. A, we're going to use it as an example of a best practice or the lack of a best practice that shows what's why why it could be better. Okay, fair enough. So if I say Arcus didn't, you know, Arcus. Uh, you know, didn't get back to me about their free app for over a week for an open case. You know, we could point that out as a bad as an example of a bad practice. That would never happen. Well, it would never happen. But well, we could point that as a bad practice or, or as a, an example of bad support. But then we could say, well, here's why. Right? The the reason to that is why it's bad is because you should always be responding. You should always let the the um, you know the person who's put it. You should always let them know where the ticket is. Right? To know or where the support request is. You know that's why there's autoresponders. That's to say, I got it right. We got it. Then you have to set an expectation. We will get to you back in within. You're, you're X. skipping all the way down to the bottom. Of well, I'm the giving best one practices. example. I'm giving one example. Well, there's many best practices. This is so just you're one. skipping all the okay. way down. So let's get into it. Let's let's talk about the good. The good. Um, I could have named this the good or the great. So how about this? Give me one company and one example of the good. Okay. So you know it's funny. I had some ideas in my head, but one happened literally today. Good. And we were sitting, we were having a, a meeting here at Arcus, an, an all Arcus meeting, and we ordered lunch. Yes. At this meeting. You, you Jason, participated. Yes, I did. You, the listener, sorry. Um, eat your own lunch. So we ordered uh, using Seamless, which has been a pick of mine in the past, mm -hmm. to order online some salads 
from Chopped. Mm -hmm. Chopped is a uh, salad chain. I don't even know if they're outside of New York. New York and D.C. New York and D.C. Okay, thank you. Uh, They make, like, really good salads. Uh, Chopped. Chopped up. Chopped salads. Designer salads. You know what's not good good. about chopped salad? What? If it doesn't have any dressing. That's what's bad about (laughs) a chopped salad. So I, I took care of the ordering. And as part of the ordering process, you order the salad. You say what dressing you'd like. And you say mixed in or on the side. Right. I ordered four salads because only four people wanted lunch. And I ordered them all with dressings mixed in. We all get our salads. None of them have any dressing on them. And none of them have no dressing came on the side. There was no dressing to be seen for the salad. Catastrophe. Yes. So we all kind of eat our salad a little bit and like... No dressing, and it's kind of lame because who eats salad without dressing? And someone in the room decided, I'm going to tweet at Seamless and tell them that we just received our order with no dressing. Do you have, uh, you know, can you rectify this? Seamless, within literally seconds, tweeted back and said, Do you have the order numbers so that we can rectify this? We tweeted. We gave them the record. Num- we gave them the order number. They reached out proactively to Chopped, and they promised that they would be there within ten minutes with the four dressings that we ordered on the side, and they were. That is good customer service. That is good customer service. And I and I want to I want to point out something because I think that's a best practice, but also I think this is a fail, not of Chopped or Seamless. Mm-hmm. But this is something we talk about a lot, and I want this to be one of our main points of – this is one of my best practices in, in, in um, support, which is that all your support channels should be of equal um, – Quality. Quality, attention, uh, expertise. And that's not to say that – that's not level one, level two, level three, which, again, we've built for many many groups. But that is to say that – and we've made this point before. Don't let your call service, your call center, be full of people who don't know what they're doing, who are fumbling around, who don't know how to answer your question, who have no ability, who can't actually make decisions and, and, and support people. Where then you have your new Twitter group who can then do things like answer quickly and, and help people. Right? The, the level of support across the organization for whatever channel you come in should be the same. Phone, if email, I, web form, right. Twitter, Facebook, what have you. And I'm not going to say that Seamless isn't doing this, but I'm but I'm going to place a bet that if I did the exact same thing by email and the exact same thing by phone, that I'm going to bet that I would not have gotten the exact same answer as quickly. I, I'm going to go ahead and bet against that Okay, because I've had good experiences with Seamless in the past. But you did phone or email? Actually, it was them proactively coming back to me. Okay. Uh, Harken back to the uh, Hurricane Sandy days. Yes. I ordered something on Seamless. The restaurant was accidentally listed as open, and they were not. I ordered. It said it would get there within 30 to 45 minutes. Within about 15 minutes, I got a phone call from Seamless letting me know that the restaurant was not open, that I would not be receiving my order, the full refund, and feel free to order something from somewhere else. Right. So that's just another good ex- um, I guess I'm calling out Seamless for having really good that's support. That's great. That's great. And, and, and that, that and was a good example because I didn't know where I ordered from was closed. It's kind of their bad on having them open. And then I went back to look at the website and that option was no longer there. Right. So they went proactively, refunded me, let me know, and took the option off the website so that no one else would make the same mistake. So let me give you two examples of non- of unequal support channels. Okay. Uh, one is old school uh, AT and T. Okay. Uh, AT and T. Uh, I called up for some issue, and again, I'm not going to. The issues aren't really matter, but I called up for some issue about the phone or, or service or something, and called and spent 25 minutes on the phone with somebody, a call center rep, a person, human being, talking to them giving them examples, giving them this, here's what I need to do, oh, we can't do that, we can't do this, we can't do that. Lots of stops, right? I then got off the call, I then tweeted that this thing had happened and I was really frustrated. 
immediately someone from AT&T gets back to me. Immediately they send ask for this thing. They then ask for you know other information. We go into DM. They then have someone call me. That then person then rectifies rectifies the situation, right? So net net win, but I took it as and I and I throw that as a loss because if you had me on the phone and already spent my twenty five minutes on the phone, why did it take me going to a social channel? to get your attention to come back. And I, and again, I'll, that was at t but I will make the same thing about Salesforce. And we're going to talk a lot about Salesforce because yeah, this is what we talk about a lot. Salesforce has done the same thing where I've had cases open for you know a week without just still in the new status, no update, no comment, no nothing, and then have tweeted at Salesforce and said, given them the case number, right. and then had the case resolved within the next day. Right. So, so it's an inconsistent support across the different channels is what we're kind of pointing out here. And it's that's very bad because that doesn't that makes that makes cuz overall we don't we you know you don't want to say oh they're good at, at Twitter support and they're bad at phone support or bad at no, you should be good support. at all channels. Right. right. It's either you're good at support or you're bad at support. And I know I know the example of the other company that you're going to bring up as really great at support. Oh, well, I was going to bring up another sort of in the road, another support channel oh, problem. I thought you were going to bring up like because we're kind of in the good. I, right, I, but I'm I know up of a really I'm you know, a company that you you manage the relationship with. Go for, for it. For, for, well, Rackspace. I think Rackspace, oh, Rackspace has like the best support out there, right? Yeah, I mean, so I'll give a I'll give a great I'll give two examples. Actually, one that happened the other day. Um, their support is absolutely fabulous. And I will tell you, if you're out there and you want to learn about support, or you want to try out support, um, you need to look at their model. I've been using Rackspace for over 10 years, something crazy like that. Um, I have used them in many different scenarios. Uh, I've had horrific things happen, like my entire server got blown up by like, like died and erased all the data at the same time. I mean, like horrific things happen. But all in all, I've stayed the customer with them. And their support is is literally second to none. And I gave the example the other day, and I'll give it again because we're in the support um, uh, thing, that I put in a ticket for something. I basically wanted uh, them to install a new version of a software uh, on my server. Right. So I'll make this – I'll put this analogy to like to Salesforce. Just like saying to Salesforce, please activate a feature in Salesforce. Right. Feature like, activation. Like admin, like admin login. Right. Login to admin. Right. Whereas, but it, this is on a Unix server. This is actually installing soft. This is like not even a feature. Act. This is much more difficult. So difficult that I couldn't do it myself. There was no way for me to do it myself. Well, maybe I could have, but whatever. I put in the ticket and then 11 minutes later, I got back. I got back the immediate response, which always happens, right? They have great, you call them up, you give your, you, you get, by the way, when you call them, you get a you get a person who then you say you give them your code, your, your number, and they forward you to a real person. You're right into a real person. I put it online because I'm like oh, that's the way I like to deal with it. Boom! I get back the auto response, and then 11 minutes later, because I have it literally I was watching, I got back the thing, and I go in to read it. You always have to go in to read it because sometimes it requires passwords, so it's not in the body of the email. I go into the portal to read it, and the response was, "We've done it." We have gone in to your server, logged in, right, username, password, and we've installed this new package for you and tested it, and it's done. 11 minutes later after me opening the ticket. That is unbelievable. And I tested it the other day for the same thing, and they responded with just as fast. So this was like five years ago, and I just did it to it. They're just that fast. Um, and, I, you know, I give that example because I don't expect that. That's not my expectation level, although with them now it is. Um but it's like it shows it shows the best of support, which is that if you give pretty clear instructions on what to happen, that they go and they execute on it. What we see a lot, and I'm not going to go to the like best practices, is no punting, right? Here's a support best practice. No punting. If you don't actually read over the support ticket enough to see what's in it and to actually act it, activate on it or to take action on it, um, and just punt back, oh, could you please survive this? Or could you please give this? Or could you, you know, you just kick back with something that's an automated kind of, it's a punt. It's saying, hey, I'm not going to handle this now. I'm going to kick it back to you, pending customer, right. with some request that really doesn't matter or really isn't part of what I'm trying to do. 
And I'll give two examples of this. Well, in I was going to give I was going to give a, a Salesforce example. I'm going to I'm going to give two. Give I'm going to give two. one one that you're not going to give. Okay, and then I'll give the other. So I was on <laughs> so I was on the idea exchange the other day, and oh. I saw the idea for Were you voting on stuff. I was I saw the idea of uh, to vote. It was the one to um, raise the limits for for chatter. Yeah. Right from 500 up. So I was voting on it. somehow. I guess the follow, I the follow I, limit. Yeah, the follow How many limits. things you can follow. It's currently 500. A huge thing voted on by a million times. At some point, someone posts on there from Salesforce a couple weeks, like last week, says, "We now can raise the limit. Put in a case to have it raised." I then said, "Oh, okay." That's great. I go put in a case. I say, you know, activation. I put it in. I put the org ID. You know, here's the org. Here's the org ID. Never understand that either because if I'm was coming it from our ID, our org. It was our org. And I, I put, understand that, but and, okay. And, and I put it. Why wouldn't I? Well, no. Why? Why you would need to? Because you're opening the case from right. Our Th- org. That doesn't make any sense, but you do. Okay. Well, here's the thing. And I said in it because I've had this problem with Salesforce before. Please connect. Please contact me via email. Please, right. please email the response or email. So they go. So you get a I, phone call. I get a phone call, and the phone call was asking for the org ID. Of course, it was. So not only were they failing by not reading the ticket, but they were failing by whatever. Then, well, then I, they really didn't read the ticket because you gave them worse two instructions. You said, "Here's the org ID. The thing you're calling me to ask for, which I asked you not to do." Right. Worse, I went and then got the email that he sent back and says, "We need a business case." Really? Yep. Business case. I want to follow more than 500 things. So I went in. I said, we follow a lot of things. We do a lot in Salesforce. We want to be able to follow more than 500. They then kick back. That's not enough of a business case. Really? At which point, you've now angered me. And I went back to the idea exchange. And I posted and I said, hey, whoever the person, I said, hey, by the way, don't tell people to go put in a case unless you realize what's going to happen to that case. Meaning they're, they're going to fumble around with it. They're not going to know what to do. And in the end, they're going to ask me for some paragraph on why I need to go file more than them when you, the product manager, have told me to go put in the case. And then I think maybe I tweeted. I think it went out to all channels. May I did a shotgun. May I ask, do, can I follow more than 500 things these days in, in our org? So by me doing that and going to Twitter and going on to thing, I got back a response from him for the person on the ID exchange. It's been raised. Your ah, org has been raised. So he just went and did it probably. Yeah. But that's not good. No. Like I know, I know somewhere someone's going. Oh, that's great! They they did it. No, no support should have just done it. Should have done it and should have done it right and not had to ask, not had to go back and, and forth that, with me multiple so, times. So let's just let's break that down for for just a second. Sure, play by play. That that's that's not necessarily a so as a whole as a high level at the whole as a holistic thing that is a support problem. But it wasn't necessarily that support engineer that you were working with's problem. One, they did make the mistake in not really reading and asking you for information that you already gave them. That's right. their fault. But, but that's systematic. You know this happens every single yeah, day. So that but that's not that's their fault. Right. It's not necessarily their fault to follow what is probably a a procedure, which right. is a best practice, have policies and procedures to ask for that business case and then get it back. I mean that that's not necessarily that support engineer's fault. It might have been a bad communication on the part of the PM who put the post in the idea exchange to say just yeah, just open a case. Probably should have wrote open a case, give a good business case about it or something like that. But, what, but I, I would ask, what's a good business case? Well, I don't know. That's Salesforce's right. decision to but decide then, what a good business case it's for It's like, is. you know, they make you put in a business case every time you turn on login as any user. Yes, but you can say, I'm an admin, I want to log in as every user. I understand, but every single time, and I've done that for so many orgs and so many times, I tell them just to email me back, I tell them to, you know, then they call me, and I know it's like trying to be good, but if you don't, if you say in it just, could you please enable the feature and and email me when it's done? Then I get a call, and it's someone telling me, and like, and now I just, oh, you know that's enabled, but you now need to turn it on. Let me show you how to do it. And I'm like, that's not what I wanted. I didn't want you to call me. I've had them come back multiple times and ask me for the org with sitting in the ticket, <clears throat> the org ID. So, you know, I think to me, and I've done this a lot, so I know Salesforce support very, very well. And again, I've had some great examples of 
of, of Salesforce Sort. But this, over the last, I would say, couple of months, I have felt like the front line to Salesforce, is, the support, has gone very, very bad. Yeah. It has turned – it has gone from being competent to almost robotic, that they are not paying any attention to what's in the ticket. They're just routing them or punting them back or hitting on – you know, hitting – Hitting the knowledge base solution to kick back to you because they are not they're not acting like someone else a human wrote this it's like another computer kicking back to another computer so they're just doing what's ever being told to do in the script right do this do this but they're not reading it and, and comprehending it which right. which is best practice if you're going to have people supporting your products or services make sure that they understand the products and services they're supporting right. and understand the process on a deeper level than just a bunch of scripts. Because yep. if it's just scripts, they're never going to be able to – because people aren't people don't think like scripts. They have to be able to problem solve. They have to be able to think outside the box. They have to be able to read and comprehend what they're reading. These are very, very important things for good support. Yep. And another one that most Salesforce folks out there who, li- who are listening have probably encountered over the course of time is the whole – provide login access punt yes like i i make a i make a point of whenever i open a salesforce case to say well to first beforehand make sure that i've already provided access right. i typically just keep that open for as long as i can and tell them in the first line i have already granted you login access you have permission to log in as me. right and I find that that has worked as a tactic. But that's me as a user needing to know to do that as opposed to them taking four seconds to check if I've already done it before kicking back to me to tell me to do it because they will kick back and tell you provide login access even if you've already done it if you don't tell them that you've done it. Right, which is bad. Which is bad because they can, they can take the 15, 20 seconds. I feel like now a lot of it is it almost m- might be too much metrics, too much, you know, KPIs or right. key performance indicators around response time and age and how long it takes from, you know, the first response to closure or whatever those metrics are that they're capturing. You know, they want to get it off their plate as fast as right. possible to say, oh, I responded really quickly and I'm waiting on customer it's sitting in the waiting on right, which stops the status, clock which does stop the clock yes right. so for us those who know and this is where i think we'll add our so what we've actually been talking about is someone who's they're actually using salesforce support we've built out this for lots of people um and have some you know fortune 100 companies using uh solutions that we've helped build and extend so we understand the back end very well of what they're trying to do we understand that you can enable you know tickers and tickers are timing things that will basically time how long certain how long tickets stay in certain statuses and that's one of the big measurements around call centers is that you know if it you you as the call center person don't want to have things in your boat for too long because then that shows as someone's running some big report oh it's been in your boat you know on average justin keeps tickets you know before his first response keeps tickets open at eight minutes and someone and jason has them over six minutes therefore jason is a better support rep but i think what you're saying which is something i'd like really to emphasize is that Good support sometimes isn't about good metrics. Right. Good support is sometimes about Being thoroughness. The customer company and helping the customer. Right. It's about thoroughness. And I'll give you another example. Uh, another company we deal with a lot, Pervasive, which is a uh, integration software. We have a ticketing system with them, and same thing. They actually use Salesforce for ticketing, so it's interesting. Do. You can read that in their header. Um, and I had an example the other day where I put in something, and it was punted back to me with a question on something that was was obvious, right? Was just mm-hmm. something that they could have gone and looked. It was either in the email or in the thread or something that, you know, um, they could have done. And I will say per, one of the things I've noticed with Pervasive is they don't give their, sale, their support people the ability to solve issues or the ability to get in and do stuff. So there's lots of punting, which is not punting like, oh, give me something that I already have, but punting like, can you do this and can you do this for me and can you do so 
so it makes the the end user, the person you know, the person who's putting in, have to do all the work. And a good support person will do as much as the work as they can without making the customer do the work. Right. Right. So don't make the customers do the work if you can do it. Now there are certain scenarios where you have to make, you know, the customer has to do stuff, but you should always be able to go as far as you can go. And, and that's it. That's where you stop. You yep. don't stop at well. I could have looked into this thing and could have done because when you when and we're not talking about like those small issues. The Salesforce one, we're actually talking about small things like um, you know enabling features and things like that. We're talking about things that need that take time to to right. really dig into. And what makes those things go longer and take harder to diagnose is because someone doesn't dig down all the avenues, right? You have to truly, if you are trying to really support or su- solve a problem, you really have to understand all the different levels and go down all the different paths and try them all out because you're really looking to take things off the plate of where it was. And I find I usually will be giving them, I'll be saying, listen, I've tried this, 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 and this, and this. Please, you know, I think it's over here. And then sometimes, and this isn't pervasive, but I've seen those, they'll, they'll ignore Every ta- every one that I gave them, and they'll go down this, you know, these other paths. I'm like, I've or- I know it's not there, you know. So, I don't know if this is a best practice, but you know, enable your people to have the tools to be able to go as far as they want. So, like Salesforce, you can log in as someone else. Like that's a great feature for right. helping support. Like Pervasive doesn't have that. Right. It can't log in as me and see or grab the log file. So there's a lot of, can well, you send me I've, the log file? I've I have, with, but, when working with Pervasive, I have given them credentials. Right, but that shouldn't have to happen. Of course not. It's That's not a, secure. A best practice is you should always be – you should have the ability to support the person in your system right. that you don't have to – And Salesforce does that well right. and has given ISVs, even even us Arcus that have free products, we can log in to orgs that – If given, if if given access. access. Obviously, we can't just log into your org. Right. But if granted access, we can log into your org and – see our product in your org and try and troubleshoot right and will if we have to otherwise we will uh ask to hop on a go-to meeting or something like that if that's convenient right speaking of go-to meeting how do you like that oh um, you give me a good bad or the ugly well, this is a this is, this is it teeters on support it's teeters on like support and social selling so this okay. starts as a good and goes to a interesting to bad okay okay so last week on friday six days ago today we're recording this on thursday but last week on friday go to meeting was was down it just was not working for a good chunk of the morning afternoon three or four hours yeah. yeah it was down and they were keeping people up to date on twitter people were tweeting at them they were responding to tweets i saw that um i tweeted at them and this is where this gets interesting. I tweeted at GoToMeeting, you've made me use WebEx this morning. <laughs> Hope you're back up soon. Please let me know. Right? As, as I was cackling because I like WebEx, I yeah. was like, well, you have to I use WebEx. I don't really like WebEx, yeah. but I had to use it. I yeah. needed to. Because it was working. Because it was working. A few minutes later, a company called Fusebox yeah, I know them. tweets back at me and says, ouch. We could get you set up with a free trial of Fusebox in less than two minutes. Let us know if you're interested. That's brilliant. Then someone at Fusebox, a person, okay. an individual, tweets at me. Um, I don't want to give out his tweet name, but he says, Hi, Justin. I work at Fusebox. Let me know if you want to explore other video conferencing solutions. So now now two people from Fusebox have tweeted at me, and I'm like, yeah. Well, two is not bad. All right, two yeah. is not terrible. But I did not reply. Okay. I didn't respond. Okay. Okay. Fusebox did their thing. They tried to get me up on a free trial, sell me something because they saw I was unhappy with GoTo. That's good stuff. That's yep. good social selling, right? Yep. Good example. Here's where it went bad. Friday, Fusebox calls me. I thought that was kind of amazing. I didn't answer the phone, though. I let it go to voicemail. Saw the tweet. Okay called did i didn't reply to the tweet which i consider like telling you i don't really care yeah so don't call me right i'm communicating over twitter like don't 
So I would say, like, don't mix that unless I ask you to. Don't change channels. Don't change the channel unless I ask you to change the channel. So don't call me. Calling me is the last thing I want you to do. I would say most people in the world do want to be called. If I'm tweeting, I right. don't want to be called. Right. Just take that as right. an example. Well, so okay? best practice is don't so change channels. Key, don't change modes, right? right? Now, not only did they call me on Friday, they called me again today. Oof. Stop calling me. You need- now you're no- now I won't try Fusebox. Right. I would have. In my spare time, I would have signed up for a free trial over a weekend or something and said, let me see what this is all about. Right. Let me see what the pricing is. Do they have enterprise pricing? I could have tweeted back at them. And I could say, hey, this is interesting. I kind of like the interface of this. I like the feature set. Now let's hop on a call and talk. Right. Now it's not happening. Sorry, right. Fusebox. So it went from like, you know, go to being proactive and communicating over Twitter the way I wanted to be communicated with. Fusebox jumping in, the good, and then going into a bad place with it. So they, they took it from something that I was really impressed with to something that I'm now completely sour to their product. So I'm going to bring up a, a good, bad, and an ugly all in one. <laughs> Runs the gamut. Yep. Huh? Because it is, and it's a best practice. Which is something that's one of the nine tenets of a customer company. Nine? Well, one of the nine tenets. Is it trust? It's trust. I love me some trust.company.com. So, so let's talk about trust and what that means. I need you know what you know what the most important thing about trust sites are? Well, I think you're you're taking my wind away, but okay, go ahead, tell me. Being able to trust them. Yes. So <laughs> what does trust mean? Well, trust, you know, a lot of ways I'm just talking about trust in terms of support. One of the things we've seen with cloud computing and internet applications is that a lot of people have thrown up these sites, these pages, these. Uh, Let's just use Salesforce as the example. Well, I'm going, but I'm going to talk trust. to about trust.salesforce.com. Trust.salesforce.com, which actually it's a link off of there that gets you to the. Here's the dashboard of all of our services and whether they're up or down. Right. Every instance, every pod. Right, and they set a good standard for that, and a lot of people have. Tra- I know uh, Amazon does that. Google um, does it. Google does it. Um, Google's app dashboard, I believe yep. it's called. So there are a lot of these. And I think a lot of people have sort of re- um, taking the idea and sort of going with it. Right. But one of the things about your trust environment has to be that it is trustworthy. It that must be. The information on it is correct. So I'm going to give a couple examples of – well, actually, I'm going, to, I'm going to give a couple examples of good. So Salesforce has a very good – system in that you know a they talk about it a lot they publicize it a lot they make it very available and they want you to go there to make sure and and as anybody's a salesforce user knows that's where you go first right to stop people from calling yep you go there you check it out i've told people that we support um from a services perspective like if something is not happening check the trust site first and if you know don't Please don't reach out to me and say my Salesforce exploded. Just go to the trust site, right. check it out. Same thing with other companies. I will say, though, recently, because we've been reported one, uh, they have recently, I guess, I don't know when this popped up, but we've known about it for like the last six months or a year or so, which is the known issues site. I love me some known issues. I do and I don't. I, I think it's a great idea. It's a great – so a known issue site is – it's like success does something slash something slash known I issues. I just Google it. If you yes. Google Salesforce, Salesforce known, known issues, issues you'll, you'll get to the Basically, page. it's bugs or things that have been reported that people can go in and say that they're also experiencing. Right. And then you can then – and I'm going to air quote – track what is going on with this. Right. But that's where I think the trust stops because the trust doesn't tell you – they don't give you very much information if it's – being looked at or in review. If you have a bug in a system and it's in review for four weeks, is that good trust or bad trust? Like I can't tell is well, in review. These typically emanate from cases right. submitted. So so I have had the pleasure of submitting a case that became a known issue. That's probably the one I'm talking about. I'm patting myself on the back. Um, but in the case when – you know, because I know about the known issue site, they wanted to close the case, and I said, "You're not closing this case because the bug is still in existence. I want you to publish this to the known issue site." So they did that, and then he said, "I'm going to publish it to the known issue site, 
I'm going to tell you, we, we know the issue. It may not be fixed for a little while. And then they put the case in the status of bug, bug request submitted or something like that. Bug fix submitted, which I thought was an interesting status because I've never seen that before. Okay. And then on the known issue site, they show all the orgs or all the pods where it's affected, all of them. And then anybody who basically has said that they're impacted by it, of whom I anybody <laughs> anybody who'll listen, I, I get them to actually say it. Because we think them. that it affects the whether they're going to change it or not. Right. We think. If if you can say it, if, if you can get that count up to hundreds, hundreds, hundreds of people. There are, there are no hundreds in there though. I looked and like five. That's because people don't know about this site. Right. It's not heavily publicized. And who's going to go spend time looking over bug reports to say well, this? No, if, if something is – again, that that should be in the support process where if somebody else were to submit a case with the exact same problem that I have already submitted, the response should be, this is a known issue. Here's the link. Go to it. Right. Say it affects you and follow it for its status. So again, I'm saying I like the idea and the partial implementation of the known issue because it gives you one more outlay and to sort of say that this is a public thing we're doing something about. But unlike almost everything else, it doesn't give you any kind of stat. Unlike a ticket that's been open for X amount of days or whatever, this only gives you it's in review and that's sort of it and how many people. And it doesn't give you a sense of if this is really a bug that's it affecting has you. has different statuses like yeah, scheduled but, for patch or something right, like that. Right, but it doesn't tell you when it's moving from one or the other. It doesn't well, no, tell you. Right. But neither does a typical case status uh, either. Tickets, it says tickets under have, review, tickets customer have days customer. open. Tickets have other, other well, this metrics has, around. This has like reported – date doesn't it yeah just reported date and and known since and reproduction and workaround like i mean that's a nice it, they yeah. actually give a workaround they're like here's how you can reproduce this but here's how you can work around it if there is one so i think that's something i would say is good but could go better and i'm it's gonna, new so let's right. give it let's give it some time i'm going to point to your example of of go to meeting as a as a status fail because I went immediately as you said it was down I went search for go to meeting status I found a page that I googled now of course I don't you know they're not well publicized if they're not the third link on your website I go to it and of course it says everything's fine right <laughs> and that's the worst the worst there's only two things that are worse than having a trust site um, there's two two huge issues with yeah. it one is if your trust site also goes down. Which used to happen to Salesforce. Oh, yeah. That you was said bad. all the time. If Salesforce was down, their trust site would go down. Yeah. That was no good. <laughs> so they fixed that. They have it. So you need to have your – so best practice, have your trust site somewhere else, um, but also have it be accurate, right? It cannot be – if if you want people to trust your trust site, you have to make sure that it is accurate and always so. It does not um, – you know, it does not report. It shouldn't report yesterday's news. It needs to report what's happening now because that's when I need it. I don't need to know that two days ago you had an outage. That actually does no good to me. What I need to know is: is it out? Is it out now? Am I having a problem right now? And I don't say now is second by second, but at least every fifteen minutes, like every fifteen minutes, I should have some sort of update on that. So, so trust is good, but m- make it trustable. Another best practice. And the last one I'm I'm going to talk about. In my good, bad, and ugly is is really escalation. Um, something I've been fighting with or talking about is to know a good a best practice in support is to know when to escalate and how fast to escalate, right? And I have noticed that some organizations don't know when to escalate something up the chain, right? I consider any production issue where a production instance is out, down, over, not working, that this should not be something that we are looking into, that we are, you know, casually talking about. This should be everybody's all hands on deck because production issues are, you know, again, I come from old school tech where production issues where beepers went off. You know, your beeper went off on a Saturday night and you would be getting back to a terminal or something to go fix Right, not like eh, I'll check it out on Monday. It's right. like no production issue down, production issue down. Level code zero one two. Especially with cloud services these days, I mean, I I feel like if you are a cloud service provider, you've got to be twenty four seven 
I, I just feel that way about because if you if if you are in control of the infrastructure and the technology that is running the service and I as the consumer can't fix your bug you've got to be there to field the question and get somebody on it to fix it or get a team of people on it to fix it and I feel like you know there are cloud providers that some are 24 7 and there are some that aren't you know they're not there on the weekend well what if I've got a heavy process running on the weekend because I want to run it on the weekend right hmm right I, I feel like that is something that also kind of needs to needs to be in place as cloud services become more and more and more commonplace and entrenched in especially in large enterprises I mean you're going to need to provide 24 7 because you know, in the large enterprise, in their data center, they've got employees that beepers go off. And yep. even when we were, <laughs> up to the days when we were, people still had the beepers, right? When, yep. when we left, you know, that was only like four years ago, people still had like the beepers for like the trading system. A friend of mine's a doctor. She still has a beeper. And I'm like, yeah. really? <laughs> she still yeah, have a beeper? Know, She's like, well, because it works. Yeah. Um, and one other, one other best practice, and this kind of goes back to the channel thing, Um. If you're getting into support or if you have support channels, I think less is more, right? You don't need to have uh, live chat and uh, text and Twitter and Facebook support um, and, you know, 24-hour phone and email. If You you're, can have them all, but you better be able to support them all the same. But I suggest that you don't have them all. You only need to have a couple of good channels. You have two good channels, it's better than six mediocre channels. What do you think is the best channel? Like, what's your preference? My preference is is a combination of online email. I want to be able to go, I always go to the support page, unless I know the support email, which is very rare. But I always go to a support page, and I want to be able to, the best practice for me is if it's something that I can authenticate against, then I want to be able to open up a ticket against my against my account. Right. So don't make me fill out information that you already have about me. Don't make me fill out my name and address if I'm, I'm logged log- into your system. I'm logged in. And better yet, and I'll say like something like um, Amazon is very good about this. When you open up a support ticket, it says, "Are you trying to get support on any one of these on these orders that you've ordered?" Well, yes, I am, and you could pick the order. So it's not like go put in your order number. It's pick the one that you have. You know, it's funny. We've completely failed to mention one of my least favorite support things. Well, go ahead. The IVR. Oh, yes. I really despise when you call somewhere and immediately you're pressing numbers to speak English. You're... You're speaking to a robot that's asking you questions, and then you answer all those questions, and it routes you to a person who then asks you all those questions again. Worst. Worst ever. The biggest pet peeve of mine. I just spent five minutes talking to a machine. That couldn't take down my information and give it to you. Yeah. that All it was doing was routing me? Just... I'd rather just press zero 16 times and get to a person. But you know it's – well, I mean this is the secret of IVRs is that they're not trying to route you. No, they're They're trying to make you. you to hang up. Yeah. That's what they want you to do is hang up. Let me give you a good example of the ugly, and I'm going to pick on Verizon. Let's get to the – this is the last one. The last one. Because we should get to our picks yeah. after this. The last one, Verizon. If you own a – if you have a uh, iOS device that has like – you know, I have the iPad mini and I have a Verizon account on it. Right. Well, your Verizon account isn't really an account account. You sign up through the iPad, and you kind of give it a credit card, and that's it. So you kind of do it once, and you kind of really forget about it. So here's the issue. You call up Verizon now. You have your iPad and your iPad, your whatever, with cellular, and you call them up, and you dial up the number that you have. Or anywhere you can find a – if you could find a 1-800 number, you dial it up, 1-800, blah, 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 tick, tick, tick. Hi, this is Verizon. Okay. Uh, put in your – Cell phone number. Or are you calling about wireless service, whatever? Put in your cell phone number. <laughs> My I, iPad doesn't I have don't one. have a cell phone number. You try clicking number. I tried this for 20 minutes. Try clicking one number. No, I put in fake numbers, and you can't get by it. 
You cannot get it by. It won't let you pass. No, nope. just put your number in. It, oh, it, you're on AT and T. It says it's not a number, and it will. And it, and if you keep pressing the buttons like zero 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 sixteen time, it goes. Sorry, we can't help. Goodbye. Ooh. The They're worst. They're just not prepared. That's that's launching a product without being prepared for for the. I had to go to my happen. Verizon rep. Business rep, get them to look to the up store, my account. Right? Oh, a, that would I mean, have been we, easy. Well, we have a store down the block from, um, from our place. Had to go to oh, via email. It made look, it sound like we live together. Yeah, look, from our place. From our place, <laughs> but that's not our anyway. Via email, he had to look up my account based on my MIE d- number, oh, yeah, and then shoot me one. back what my phone number on my iPad was. Oh, the fo- there's actually a phone number. There is, to but it? who would know? How would you get that? Exactly. And even your is it in your bills? No, it's not. How it's the last four that? digits are in your bill. Oh. Yeah. Hmm. That's not good. Uh, yeah. uh. All right. <laughs> so the state of the state of uh, support, I think, we gave, I think we gave some good, good examples. One. We gave some I good want practice. some feedback on this. Give us give us some feedback yeah. for those listening. I want to know. Tweet us. Do like a hashtag uh, support special. Support special. There yeah. you go. Hashtag support special. All right. Um so that's it for this week. We all come back. We've got all new sorts of news for next week. Tons of stuff. Yeah. We just thought we'd kind of do a full rant on support for an episode, and then it was a see rant, how that went. But we gave some good kudos to other, yeah. to some people too. So yeah. attention to detail. It's yeah. really big. All, all right. right, so let's do our cloud folks app pick let's of the week. Pick it up. Oh, and and in oh. the Google Doc it says surprise for JMA, which I think means me. That's you, JMA, being your initial. I gotta look mine up. If anyone's ever gotten an email from Jason, it's JMA. That's, that so, is correct. Let me reach into my uh, drawer of goodies here. Okay. Now, it's a little late in the season to be giving you these, but I found <laughs> these things. Mittens? Hold on. Kittens? I found these things. You're hearing the, the crinkling of the box. Yes. They're called High Call Bluetooth Talking Gloves. <laughs> okay. Is... I found these online. From a company called High Fun, and what these gloves do, they include three buttons. They're chargeable via USB. Okay. Okay. Of well, anything that's chargeable, and they allow you to Bluetooth connect to your phone, your iPhone in this case. So connect your glove to your phone. Your glove. Yeah, I get. Okay. I got you. There is a speaker in the left thumb. Oh no! And there's a microphone. In the left pinky, I'm doing. So I'm you doing hold what? Hold yeah. up, yeah. Imagine yeah. that. You just hold your glove up to your face ear hole and your face, and you talk through your glove. It connects via Bluetooth. There's a button on it to 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 uh, use Siri. Yeah. So you can like hold down a button and tell Siri to call somebody, and it calls, and you're just standing there with your glove talking and it's awesome you can you know you can pick up the phone have you tried and, these yeah i have i bought a pair for myself and i decided that i would buy you and the partner that shall remain nice. was a pair because i thought they were so oh that's so cool it's kind of like a um a like a fun little it's like gaggy surprise gift. but yeah so here's a little gift for you I just my saw, cloud focus app pick of the week. We were talking the other day. I was up in your apartment and I saw the. You I see, saw you this. Saw that. And yeah. I thought you were like collecting Prince albums. No, has, they're <laughs> they're Italian made. Oh, uh, or designed at least. High and fun. they also have like the, uh, like they're the gloves that you can use to actually control the phone with. So you have to take your gloves off to oh, push okay. buttons. Yep. Yep. So. There are buttons on the actual gloves to control the phone. That is but there's also like funny. two of the fingers on each glove are those like um They're like conductive yeah things where you can like swipe and <laughs> hit touch screen things. So I thought they were cool, so I bought everyone a pair. That is funny. <laughs> that is funny. I can't wait to try that. So there's a high fun high call. By the way, bad uh, naming. They're I, Italian I, design. Yeah, I, some of the the instructions are like you have to get to like the fourth page of instructions to get it. In. Designed in <laughs> Milan, made in China. Yeah, the, the the instructions are in Italian and then Spanish and then English. Oh yes, so, microfono. Yeah, power button. Last I think you'll find cool. them interesting. All I right. tested them; they work. And you can hear people. Yeah, you can hear, and they can hear you. It's awesome. <laughs> 
You just hold up your hand to your to your. I think you know we've talked about wearable technology. Yeah. this is kind of an interesting that concept. That is that is very fun. And it high charges fun, with a call. mini USB, mini or USB? A micro USB, micro USB. Yeah, very funny. Which it comes with. That is cool. I will uh, I will try those out. <laughs> uh, I have. How been, fun is that? That Come is on. very fun. That was a fun little. That is very not fun. Not very cloudy, but a pick of the week. Well, a hardware pick of the week. Mine's not going to be cloudy, but it's going to lead me into a blog post I'm going to do soon, which I started talking to you about, um, which is uh, on on paperless. You know, we have been talking about scanners and doing things paperless, and obviously. One of the beauties of going to Salesforce and doing Salesforce stuff is that you stop, you cut down on the amount of paper because you're not printing things out. You're keeping them in Salesforce. You're routing them. You're collaborating with Chatter. You know all the great stuff you can do in Salesforce. So, and I actually bought a book, uh, and I think I talked about this the other day called Paperless. It's an ebook and it had all these videos in it, and I really, really love it. Great it's on the, uh, it's on iBooks actually. Um, but and I talked about the scanner I got. So this is the scanner's sister or brother or cousin, right? Okay. So you need to have a good scanner, and the scanner I bought is fabulous. The scanner I, you gave me is a little buggy. Well, it's like five years Software old or six years buggy. old. The one, the new one, like that was almost a tease to get you go buy a new scanner. Yeah, because now you're like <laughs> well, getting me free. into the scanning, and I'm like, oh, because I did all my tax stuff. Yeah. Like you still get stuff in the mail that I couldn't even. I am dumbfounded by the fact that you can't download certain tax forms yeah. online. Like, why can't I download this? You have to mail this to it's me? Called, really? It's called the government. Oh, it's terrible. Um, no, not tax. No, like like 1099s from banks. Like, some of them just Oh, really? Some online. of them? Well, that's bad banks. Then. Terrible. Yeah. <clears throat> City. <clears throat> <laughs> well, <clears throat> Chase does it fine online. I know. I and, got my and, Chase one online, and they mailed it to and me, Amex. which I prefer they didn't. Amex but. is pretty good, too. All right, so what you also need when you have a good – when you scan a lot of stuff, you have to have two extra things. And I'm going to tell you about – I guess I'll tell you about both. I'll make both my pick because they're, they kind of go together. There's some documents that you need to keep paper format for because you need to keep them, right, long term. But you want right. to make sure that you know that you actually kept them. Right. So I went and bought – and I think I showed you – maybe I didn't show you, but uh, – um, I should have bought a bunch of them, but I have now in the office. I have a, a red. I saw it scanned. I was like, thing. "What is that?" Yes, so it's a a, a, it's a stamper. A stamper, right? That just says "scanned." You go to Amazon, just type in "scan stamper" or whatever, and you just you. So it's great. So when you scan in something that you know processed, processed, yeah, you just scan it. So then you know that it's been scanned. So then when you look at it later in life, you don't go, "Did I scan this in?" Then the other thing you need, which I've had for a long time, this is, I think, my third one in probably 10 years, um, is you need a shredder. You need a good shredder. And I had one from Office Max that was pretty good, but eventually, like last two months ago, like something broke off of it. Like the roller broke off of it. It's always been a bit big and big, hefty. But I have a scanner, or I have a, well, I have a scanner, thanks to you, you gave yeah, me the yes. hand me down. Yep. And I have a shredder. But it's kind of crappy. It can yeah. only shred six pages at a time. So I went on the thing to go find a new shredder. So I went Did and you I buy like a super shredder. I went and I found some good articles and I went and I basically bought the Power Shred, the Fellows Power Shred seventy nine <laughs> CI. <laughs> but let me tell you why this is good because this is like this is you taking know, shredding to we, the next level. We do live in the same building. Yes. And there is the shredding service in the building. Yeah, I don't. From Iron Mountain. You a, can drop stuff I don't, in there. I don't trust that. You don't and trust I want, that, I want, really? to shred, I want to shred. I want to shred things in my apartment as part of my process. So I scan, then shred. But I had this old one. I got this new one. First of all, you need to have a cross-cut shredder. You need a cross-cut. Because if you watch Argo. Yeah, if you've seen Argo. They, they will pay. <laughs> they, you they, can hire some sweatshop kids, and they will. They will put it together. They will tape it back together. So you need a cross-cut. Cross cut. That's number one. Two is you want one that can't jam. So the new shredders have these things in them that will stop. It will not let you jam it. So it will either stop you from putting in too much or when it gets enough, it will slow down and then it will slowly work through it. So anyway, I read the reviews on this on Amazon. It's not cheap, but if you're really into into being paperless, this is one of the things. And hopefully you, sk- you shred less and less. Side tip for you paperless shredders, here's what I do. I don't shred every time I get stuff. What I do is I have a black envelope sitting right beside next to the shredder because, you know, shredder's on or off or whatever. 
and anything that I need to shred, paper that comes out, I just throw them into this little black envelope that's sitting there. And there's two purposes. One is because you want to shred in batches. You want to go once a week and just shred it all at the same time because it's just quicker that way. Save yourself some time. Second is it gives you a little bit of, you know, a little bit of fallback. So you put something in the little shred the little shred folder. Yeah, because shredders don't have an are you sure button. No, there's no are you sure. So you put something in the, sh- in the, in the shred. And I've maybe done this once, but – and it sits there for the week, and then if you need it within the week, you, or you forgot, or you put something in there by mistake, or you put not the check stub, but the check, something like that, it's sitting in there. You can go save it. So I would suggest a little folder on your desk or an inbox or something. You make it your shred folder. Make sure it's where people know where to put shred stuff, stuff that gets shredded in the household. <laughs> um, and then I would say that shred anything with your name on it. Anything with your name on it, shred it. Identity theft huge problem shred anything with your name on it if it has your name on it or your address shred it um and go forward so power shred 79 ci the world's toughest shredders fellows great one amazon prime shipped how much, it to me how much oh <laughs> it was not cheap oh all right forget it. uh no it was like 178 bucks i didn't give away the price of mine because yeah. it was a gift yeah oh, okay well, I, I did could. then just type it in it, it, they were, i think oh. they were like 69 dollars. oh that's something. cool yeah, I mean the the one I, the most expensive one I think I've picked so far is the uh, didn't I pick uh, yeah I picked the the scanner the scanner was not cheap. We well, did pick Spring Eleven once. So that's pretty expensive. On how many no, you one have. license. <laughs> that's was it really Spring Eleven? <laughs> that's still a All right, chunk and change. All right, uh, so that's it for this week. We will be back next week with more cloud news, less support. We will always be here to support you though. Um, remember to go follow us at, at Justin, Just Edelstein, at Jason M. Atwood, at Arcasync, Facebook slash Arcasync. We're on the Twitter. We're on the Facebook. We're on the Google+. Plus. We're in the Dreamforce portal still. We're still there. We still have a group in there for the podcast if you want to follow us in there. And we're on the iTunes, the Tune of I, if you want to leave reviews there. Someone actually mentioned that they don't trust iTunes. They wouldn't leave a review there. Wow. It is really the only really? place you can leave a review of a podcast. I guess. If you, you can... know of another place you can review podcasts, that would be great. But it's kind of like the only place you know to review a podcast. Yeah, people don't trust why? I don't know. Okay. So, yeah. Hey, well, whatever. Whatever you want. Until next week, we'll be back with another episode. And say, enjoy those cloudy days. Bye.